May the Lord give you peace. Welcome to our Lenten series, Reflections on the Lenten Gospels. And I'm happy to welcome today Brother Bill Short, who is with us. And Bill, uh, hello, and tell us a little bit about what you uh, do currently uh, as a friar and what you do for the order. Well, as as we're speaking right now, I'm at the Franciscan School of Theology at the University of San Diego, uh, doing a little teaching here during the uh, the interval between the fall and spring semesters. I'll shortly be going back to my residence, my usual place of residence, which is St. Isidore's College in Rome. There, I'm the director of our uh, historical institute called the College of St. Bonaventure, the Friar Editors of Quaraki, which I know you know very well, Greg, and you've visited, a place uh, associated with the history of Franciscans uh, for over 400 years uh, with Father Luke Wadding and his writing of the history of the order there. Uh, we continue that work in our own small way today with an international team of scholars. And I'm uh, I'm the manager of the, the scholarship group. So it's a, it's a wonderful place and in a beautiful location in downtown Rome. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to invite you then to read uh, the Lenten gospel that you have for uh, this week. Let us listen to the gospel according to John in chapter three. Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. Bill, I know you're uh, a scholar who has for many years studied the Franciscan tradition, the intellectual tradition, as we friars talk about it, that's our jargon for it. It basically uh, steeping yourself in the history of of the documents of uh, surrounding Francis and his followers. How does this gospel speak to you out of uh, that tradition, to you as a friar? In preparation for this recording, I was thinking that over and over again in my mind. And a couple of I don't know how to describe them. A couple of packages of insights came to me. The first is an image, uh, the image of the crucifix of San Damiano. The second is the, the image of Brother Son from the Canticle of the Creatures or the Canticle of Brother Son by Francis. And the third is the very conclusion of the that same canticle by Francis, where he talks about uh, the end and death. So um, in no particular order, I'm going to try to unpack those a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that very opening statement where 
Jesus is talking about the, the serpent that is lifted up in the desert. And we're familiar with that story from the Old Testament, that all of those who looked at this bronze image of a serpent were healed from the snake bites, poisonous snake bites uh, that they had received. So this image of the, the serpent raised up on a pole or uh, on a piece of wood in the desert is alluded to here in John's gospel. And it's that characteristic of John when he speaks about the death and resurrection of the Lord. He speaks about it as all one event. The, the Lord who is dying and rising, his being lifted up on the cross is also his glorification. It's a very interesting view, and it's reflected beautifully in the crucifix of San Damiano, where we see the, the open eyes of a Christ who clearly has wounds and blood, but who who is clearly wide awake. This is someone who has gone through death, through suffering, the crucifixion, and is alive. Mm -hmm. that, that image, I think, of being lifted up, here contrasted or compared with the image of the serpent, I think really makes that icon of the San Damiano crucifix a, a beautiful one for a Lenten meditation. We know that the Gospel of John was uh, Francis's favorite gospel by far, uh, and his reading of the Gospel of John was not so much on the, the how-to of life. It wasn't so much about the practicalities. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are good on the details. John is his text for prayer, and particularly for praying in within the person of Jesus. He, he kind of steps inside the skin of Jesus, if we can say that, and looks out at the world through his eyes. Uh, so Francis himself is lifted up by his identification with Christ to get this kind of Jesus eye view of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one cluster of images. Stop me whenever you want, because I can go on and on. The, the second has to do with light. Mm. That whole contrast, again, very common in John's gospel, between light and darkness, and here uh, expressed very clearly in terms of judgment, that uh, it's not the purpose of Jesus coming into the world to, to condemn this world, uh, to issue some verdict, to, uh, to condemn the unbelievers. Rather, that, that's a self-judgment. We, we perform our own judgment on ourselves by either believing in the Son of God, that is, believing that Jesus has been sent by the Father, or refusing to believe that. Uh, the judgment is based on our actions, our, our belief or lack of belief. It's not something external to us in this part of John's gospel. I think the other piece of that that is, uh, I mean, very helpful for me is thinking of how important light was in the writings of Francis. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhat uncharacteristically here in San Diego today, it is not a sunny day. Uh, it's actually rainy. But uh, usually we are blessed with lots and lots of sun, as we are usually in Rome at this time of year. For Francis, that image of the brightness of the sunlight, even when he was nearly blind in the last year or so of his life, okay. is something that he said reminds him of God. He uses this interesting phrase, he the brother, brother son, carries your meaning most high. He, he So he carries something that tells us who you are, and it's this bright light. Here, on the other hand, the light is something that's attractive to those who are drawn toward, 
toward belief in Jesus and something which is refused by those who don't want their deeds revealed because their deeds are evil. So San Damiano crucifix, brother, son, and light, and how God is light. And the third one is at the end of the canticle, the part maybe that we don't like so much, where Francis says, woe to those who die in mortal sin. So woe to those who die hating the light, uh, hating God, uh, hating the Son who has been sent into the world, uh, not to condemn it, but to save it. Um, and blessed are those who will be found in your most holy will. Uh, and what is God's will? Uh, that we should believe in Jesus, whom he has sent. So it kind of comes full circle. That, that might be enough for me, though. You might have another comment or question, Greg. Well, if you look at this and you were interpreting this gospel for a, a particular you know, group of listeners, who is who would this be good news for then uh, in our day and age? Well, I think it's especially good news for for anyone who lives with an image of a wrathful God, mm -hmm. um, a God who is who is determined to punish, uh, to to inflict suffering. And I think it's a very good corrective to views also about why Christ came that are very, um, very much opposed, contrary to our Franciscan tradition. Um, the Father sends the Son out of love. Uh, it's, it's not a payment uh, to the devil or to someone else to atone for the sin of Adam. That's not the purpose. God sends the Son to save, uh, to give life. I mean, when you we think the word salvation and the word salve, uh, like a healing ointment, have the same root in Latin. That's it's a healing work, and it's a work of love. If if Jesus did not come to judge the world, uh, didn't come to condemn the world, I think that's good news for all of us. Mm -hmm. We are the the objects of God's love. Uh, that love is healing. The ministry of Jesus is so much about healing, about freeing people. So I would say for anyone, a Catholic or otherwise, mm -hmm. who has been kind of brought up or ingrained with an idea of a wrathful God uh, who's constantly condemning, uh, this gospel is very good news. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way it is. Mm -hmm. I think there's a kinship between our time and the time of Francis. Uh, Francis lived in a time of an institutional church, caught up in it in the medieval world with politics and warfare and so forth. and and his his view cut through a lot of that for the ordinary folks, didn't it? Yeah, I think this the genius of Francis is his simplicity that is to look, at especially the words of Jesus, in his view, the words that are literally spoken by Jesus in the gospel. We generally don't look at the scripture that way today as a, a kind of tape recording, but in the Middle Ages, that would have been a common way to read the scriptures. He's not so interested in the details of the evangelist, uh, the gospel writer talking about it was a nice day, people were out fishing, uh, mm -hmm. someone was sitting under a fig tree. He's not too interested in that. He says, where is Jesus speaking or doing something? That's what I'm interested in. And in his preaching that and his writing, that's what he focuses on. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, a, a, a simple message that many people in his own day understood and continues to be a very appealing part of him as a figure in the church today and throughout the world in human society globally. Mm -hmm. And in our post-pandemic world, I, I don't I, I suspect you and I both are similar in that we meet people for whom an institutional church or a God that they learned about as as uh, as children or 
somewhere along the line that 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 is no longer attractive to them. Uh, and it sounds to me like you're saying this message in a post-pandemic world, in a world that has a lot that it's wrestling with, uh, that this is a message that really applies, uh, that we can bring to people. Yeah, I think that anyone who looks on uh, on religious belief, in this case, Christian belief in the person of Jesus as the one sent by God, mm-hmm. when it when it is a source of healing, uh, when it is a source of life, uh, when it is about love and not about condemnation, I think that's attractive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think a message that is about condemnation uh, and punishment and imposing suffering has turned off so many people to Mm -hmm. religious messages, and I think rightly so, Mm -hmm. because I think what we see at the heart of our own Franciscan tradition is a reading of the entire story of Jesus as a story of a God who loves us, who is constantly pursuing us even when we run away. You you uh, work in an academic setting much of the time. Uh, how does this challenge you as a Franciscan, uh, and and maybe as and how would it challenge the rest of us uh, as friars or and as people uh, of good of goodwill of a Franciscan heart in our world today? What what kind of challenge do you see us taking uh, to the people, the communities that we serve? Well, perhaps the biggest one, a challenge for ourselves and a challenge for those we serve, is that message about who am I to judge? I mean, it's been echoed by Pope Francis. It's certainly right at the center of this gospel. Uh, Jesus does not come to condemn. Uh, the verdict has already been passed by our our love either of light or of darkness. Uh, that's uh, we, we pass our own verdict. Mm-hmm. To, to constantly remind ourselves that this, this business of judgment, which is so ingrained in some religious traditions, uh, is refuted here. It is, uh, it is not the purpose for the coming of Jesus. It is rather to love, to heal, uh, to bring us back from, from the dark uh, mm-hmm. into the light. I think that's a, mm-hmm. it's a very positive message. Yeah. And, we need to hear it. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the San Damiano cross, and I think also of the story that of Francis at at his at his death asked that the Gospel of John be read. And I always think of the Gospel of John as somehow bookending Francis' life. He he encountered it in the icon at, at the darkest time in his life, uh, in in his process of conversion, and then as he's preparing to meet death, he wants to hear this good news again, right? Uh, there seems to be a, a real continuity throughout his whole conversion experience and his his lived experience uh, in in life. Yeah, and it seems that the the Gospel of John was a text he prayed with so frequently. Uh, we know that it, the selections from the Gospel of John are actually sewn into the back of his prayer book that we still have in Assisi, his breviary. Uh, he has some selections. From the other gospels as well, but a very large section of that comes from John's gospel. I think he prayed that gospel so much that in a way it got inside him and he got inside it. It's a a kind of mutual communication of John, the author of the fourth gospel, his proclamation of Jesus and the the personal story of Francis, who finds this text, particularly the last chapters of the text from chapter 17 onward, as kind of this rich source for meditation and personal transformation, his uh, his go to text mm-hmm. of prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, your those chapters, some of that is the last discourse, as we call it. And what always appeals to me is, the disciples are asking Jesus questions in this last discourse. You know, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Are you going to show us the Father now? And I always imagine those are questions that Christians are, have been asking of Jesus all the way through time. And, you know, we read 
those texts uh, in Lent. We read them also in the Easter season. But these were questions on the lips of the disciples, perhaps, in some setting, uh, but also the early church and maybe the communities we serve now, people are still asking those questions. How do we know the way? Will, is this way, you know, how will we show the world the Father, you know, as you ask us to do and so forth? These are these questions are, are uh, in some ways still valid for all of us today when when we are with a group of people that we're that we're ministering among huh? well and i think if we read the the gospel of john in the section just before this sunday's gospel uh, it is actually a question and answer session with nicodemus mm -hmm. and it seems that there are some other disciples around as well and jesus is kind kind of saying but nicodemus you know, you're you're a teacher of the law, and you you can't figure out these things. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Nicodemus is this really kind of engaging character. Of so many of us, I think, can identify with him. Who's who's almost, but not quite. He wants to believe, but he can't quite get there. His whole formation and upbringing makes it very difficult to to accept this this freeing, non-legalistic religion that Jesus is proclaiming. And yet, good old Nicodemus, who shows up at the end to anoint the body of the Lord, who has been lifted up, Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night, who came in the dark, mm -hmm. I think because he was a little bit afraid, mm -hmm. um, and now comes into the light on, uh, on the afternoon of Good Friday, just as the sun is setting. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, it really ties in so well then, I think, to what Francis was bringing to people in his time. And I guess it's our legacy then to, to try to do something of the same. Huh? I think to present an alternative vision of who God is uh, in a way that is, is positive, which is healing, which is non-judgmental. I think uh, if we do that, uh, we do honor to the uh, the wonderful author of John's Gospel. I think he has a great insight into the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Can you leave us with a question that we might take into this week of Lent uh, for uh, for those who are watching and, and reflecting with you now uh, as they hear this Gospel? Yeah, it's a it's an odd one, I suppose, but it's kind of open ended. So I think maybe a lot of different people might be able to to use it. It's where is the dark in my life? Mm -hmm. Where is the light? And how can I move away from dark? and toward light. That's, I think that's the invitation of Jesus in uh, in this Sunday's gospel. You've left us with a lot to think about. Uh, thanks so much, Bill, for sharing your scholarship with us and also your insights into the, into the gospel. Uh, I hope that those who are watching this series will join us again as we continue our our journey uh, through Lent and the Lenten Gospels with the Franciscan lens. Thanks so much, Bill. Thank you.